about once or twice a stream, I get this specific question. I am a new player to Civ. What Civ or leader should I play to learn the game? This is a very valid question because in a game like Civilization, there are a lot of complex mechanics that look simple to those who play the game regularly. But for those that haven't played Civ, let alone a 4x strategy game ever, you might as well be asking them to review the code of the game. Now my response to this question, without fail, is our dear Emperor Trajan of Rome. There are a couple other civs I usually recommend as well, some of those being Japan, Germany, but above everyone else, Rome is by far the best civ at learning the game. In this video, I'm going to go over why Rome excels at this, why they're the best civ for new players, and why they're the perfect example of a solid, good civilization. If you're not familiar with me, I'm Bose. I play Civ 6 on Deity every week on my stream at twitch.tv slash Bosetheus. I have around 3k hours in this game specifically of Civ 6. Probably close to 10k with the entire Civ franchise as a whole, but you know, they didn't really keep track of hours back then. Uh, what I'm saying is I don't have the end-all be-all knowledge on the game. Uh, that's what makes this game and franchise so great is that multiple people can be correct about the same exact issue. But this is my basis of knowledge. I have a lot of experience, so I hope that answers your question. Now, what constitutes a beginner-friendly Civ? As mentioned previously, there are a couple civilizations that I would recommend to beginners of this game, and they all have one thing in common. They're all very straightforward. Some other Civs in this game, while not intensely complicated, can make the game a little bit too muddled if you're struggling with the concept of things like districts for your first three playthroughs. Take Vietnam. Vietnam's districts themselves have a placement restriction on them, except for their unique encampment. Now, you might be thinking to yourself right now, okay, well, that's obvious, it literally tells you in the text. And while you may be right, the average player in Civilization VI may not realize this, and they may just gloss over text. Take into consideration Steam achievements and Steam charts. This doesn't include Epic Games and console players, that is a large portion of players, but only 5.9% of all Civilization players on Steam have beat the game on Deity difficulty. Only 3.4% of all Steam players have won a regular game at any difficulty as Alexander, who is one of the oldest Civs in Civ 6. And then finally, only 31%, one third of all players have beat a regular game of Civilization on Prince, which is the default difficulty in the game. Those who play on Deity, those who watch Deity players, those who watch Let's Plays and think about changing up various play styles, are very, very, very small sample size compared to the average Civ player who's maybe only played 20 hours in their lifetime. And in this case, they're more than likely only playing vanilla Civ, which was free on Epic Games. I want you to do an experiment, and the next time you're on Twitch browsing for channels, I want you to go to the Civ 6 category, go past the top two rows of Deity and CPL players, and click on a random stream, and I guarantee you will find someone who has maybe only played around 10 hours of the game, they're playing with their friends, they have quick combat and movement disabled, and they're on like turn 75, and the only things that they have are three spearmen and no districts. Now this is not meant to be a bash on this player at all. Civilization VI doesn't really teach you how to play the game, even with their tutorial, but it's to give you an example of what I mean a new player, it's really hard not to get lost in the sauce when all you're trying to do is do sub-150 science victories with Babylon. Now where do we go from here? As mentioned previously, I recommend very straightforward civs in this game in order to learn how to play and get used to the mechanics of the game to be better. Now earlier, I mentioned Japan. They get you some district bonuses. Germany, they become a very straightforward production powerhouse. But with Rome, you just get things for free. Let's go ahead and outline and look over the abilities of Rome and see how they help a new player get better. We'll start with Trajan's Leader ability, one of the best in the game, Trajan's Column. Trajan's Column states this, All founded cities start with a free building in the city center, a monument if the game has started in the ancient era. Since the majority of players don't necessarily play anything else or change settings other than what is default, maybe they'll just only change the map, we're going to assume that we are starting in the ancient era like most games, and therefore all of your newly founded cities, including our capital, are going to be getting a free monument. Now if you've played Civilization V before, you'll understand how strong this is. I mean, the final patch of Civ V reworked tradition so that you wouldn't get a free monument in your first four cities too early, since going tradition was so strong at that time. Why was this a big deal? Monuments in Civ VI are one of the most important buildings in the entire game, 
specifically because of how the early game works. There are multiple dedicated videos on YouTube about which building you should build first. Should you build a monument first? Should you build a granary first? This discussion still goes on today. I am team monument, by the way. Monuments give you plus one culture, plus one loyalty per turn in the city, and if that city is at 100% loyalty, it gives you plus two culture. This may seem like nothing at first, you're like, okay, that's one extra culture, but in the early game, specifically the ancient era, that one additional extra culture immediately right off the bat is one of the strongest yields that you can get. As it turns working Code of Laws, the first civic, to about six to seven turns instead of around 10 to 11 turns, which allows you to get to political philosophy faster. This whole discussion will be saved for another video, but culture for me is king in Civ 6, especially in the early game. The too long didn't read version is that it doesn't matter how fast you can research, you can only work so much production with a few cities. But culture doesn't care about production, because culture cares about policy cards. Now that's obviously not the end all be all, but if you can get to political philosophy about 15 turns faster than another Civ, you basically snowball way faster, way sooner. Which is why cultural pantheons are generally picked a lot if something like religious settlements or a civ specific pantheon such as sacred path is taken knowing this and not having to take 10 plus turns to build a monument in the early game means you could just build other things you can spend time getting out an early game army if you want to go to war you can maybe get an extra builder maybe even get a second settler immediately after building your first one since you don't have to spend 60 extra production on a monument this is on standard speed for newer players, that's one less thing they have to worry about when it comes to memorizing and build orders in the beginning of the game. It allows them to focus on other things at hand. It allows them to stay competitive with the AI or maybe even other players without having to think about what they're doing too much. Especially when it comes to rise and fall with loyalty and that when that becomes an issue. Rome's Civ ability is incredibly powerful and that is basically unmatched by a lot of Civs in the game. All roads lead to Rome. Founded or conquered cities start with a trading post, and if they are within the trade route range of the capital, a road is built to it. Trade routes generate plus one additional gold for Roman trading posts as they pass through. This in itself is incredibly powerful. It allows Rome to basically be an early game domination force, as they have the power to back up their reinforcements very, very fast. The first aspect of this, in the name of it, is roads. You can only build roads in Civ a few ways. You either use a trade route that creates a road as it passes through tile through tile, or you can use a military engineer where they have two charges available and you can use up one of those charges to place a road individually on the map. Districts also automatically create roads on their tiles if you did not know that too. Now this has incredible advantages as roads help unit movement on the land, allows them to not use up their valuable movement points when attempting to cross terrain such as forests, hills, rivers, etc. Now, for example, here, a warrior has two movement points that can be used in order to move across the map. Moving across one flat tile that does not have a feature on it only costs one movement point, which means you can move across two before spending all of your points. Now, attempting to move onto a hill that is only one tile away from your warrior will use up all of your movement points as it costs two in order to do so. Roads allow you to bypass the movement limitations of these features and tiles, meaning that if you have a road that goes through a hill or a forest, you will move along these roads as if they are flatland tiles, ignoring these limitations. Roads only get better as the game goes on, as they are upgraded through eras. If, for example, they allow you to cross rivers using only one movement point, or they cost less throughout the game. Now, Rome gets this for free. Again, as I stated earlier, getting things for free is better than not getting things for free. <laughs> And this is just another thing that Rome does, whether or not you settle the city yourself. The caveat is that obviously it has to be within this trade route range of the capital, which is 15 tiles. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot initially, but this is in a radius and will probably encompass your entire empire that you create if you're not doing like a full-on domination game. On top of this, the cities start with a trading post, which is, if you're unaware, a quote-unquote building that sort of sits inside the city center that extends the trade route range of the original trade route and acts as sort of a reset of that range. Uh, these are created when a trade route is finished. This also provides plus one gold to the trade route passing through it, in which Rome's ability stacks with it and provides plus two gold in total. Uh, too long didn't read, free equals better. For a new player, since there is so much to memorize and remember in the first place, being able to move around freely with the roads, not have to worry about trying to strategically set up roads via trade routes, is once again another aspect of the Civ that just gives blatant early game advantages for the inexperienced. 
The unique Roman unit, the Legion, ranks up there with one of the best units in the entire game, uh, especially for units in their era. This unit replaces the Swordsman and is better than the Swordsman in about 99% of their aspect, so let's go ahead and just compare them really quickly. A Swordsman costs 20 iron, but a Legion only costs 10 to build. A Swordsman has 35 combat strength, but a Legion has 40. Both of them have plus 5 combat strength versus anti-cav. Uh, a Swordsman does only cost 90 production, and the Legion does cost 110. The Legion also has a Builder Ability Charge. Now, you can only use this to create a Roman Fort or clear the terrain. It can also repair just like a Builder does too. Now, you can see here that the Legion is just basically a better Swordsman. The only downside for the Legion is that it does cost 20 more production, uh, but that only really means you're going to be, if you are hard building it, taking about one to just around two turns slower than a regular Swordsman. This, however, it's usually made up by the fact that it only costs 10 iron to build them, so you'll usually be able to build Legions faster, or if you have already built a couple Warriors, you can upgrade them faster than you would uh, with a regular Swordsman. Now, for beginner players, Legions are just a very straightforward unit. It's a better Swordsman, it costs less iron to build, it does a lot of damage. One of the big things, too, is it's also in the same exact spot on the tech tree as a Swordsman is. That way you don't have to go up and down the tech tree to get random units such as like Impies or Kevsers, for example. Out of all the things in Rome's kit, I would say that the bath is probably the most non-beginner friendly aspect of it. The bath is a district, it's a half cost aqueduct, Rome's version of it, and it does provide a lot of benefits that an aqueduct does not. It provides you plus two extra housing as well as an extra amenity that you wouldn't otherwise receive. Now this may seem small, but the final changes to amenities that they made made them very, very important, and if you're attempting to win the game on higher difficulties, you'll start to understand this very quickly. The majority of players that are new to the game aren't necessarily going to realize the impact that amenities have in your cities, nor should they necessarily have to. Regardless, the layperson generally understands what an aqueduct is. Aqueducts equal water coming to city, equal clean housing slash more food, equal cities are going to grow. If new players read that a bath equals an aqueduct, they should be able to deduce that building these will allow their cities to grow. Even with all of this, I still think the bath can be a very beginner-friendly district because it only provides positives to their empire. A new player to the game might go to their production tab and see that all of the districts are grayed out except for the bath because they don't really understand that the district population has a cap restriction. And then they also see that it's only going to cost them around two to three turns to build, so when they research it, they go, oh, hey, I should build that. It's very cheap, without maybe fully realizing all of the benefits that they're getting. This, in turn, allows them to gain a lot of yields and allows their cities to grow very tall, which will benefit them in the long run. Rome is especially good for a new player because all of these abilities and aspects of Rome get the player ahead without having to confuse them too much with extra abilities, such as Jadwiga's Lithuanian Union religious culture bomb shenanigans. Now sure, there are other abilities that are really strong and give you amazing bonuses. Uh, take Cyrus's Fall of Babylon, for example. But a new player to the game isn't necessarily going to understand how to capitalize on these abilities and use them within their timings. Rome allows beginning players to get and use these abilities without having to think, okay, so actually how does this help my civilization and how am I supposed to use it? You get a building. You get roads, and you get these for free just by doing the most intuitive thing about Civilization VI, expanding and growing your empire. You get extra gold and culture as an added bonus just for doing these basic things that are the foundation and basic mechanics of the game. Getting extra yields and things for free, uh, once again, I'm going to say that again, for free by doing the next intuitive thing in the game that allows you to progress puts Rome on top for helping out newer players and allows them to play the game without confusing them too much with niche civilization abilities. This is also why I mentioned Germany and Japan in this video as well. Their abilities are very straightforward. Okay, once again, how many times am I going to say straightforward? They help you increase your yields and resources in logical, intuitive ways. It's these reasons here that a lot of the times in tier list videos and in streams, arguments are made about why civs like Rome are the best civ in the game. And if you're not doing things like min-maxing to the extreme or abusing a Russian classical era golden age, it makes sense that these civs are on people's minds. With that, 
I still suggest that Rome is the best sieve to play if you are just getting into Civilization VI. They are a fun sieve, they're a very easy sieve to play, and they're still very strong. Now I hope this helps you understand why I recommended Rome. It's just a question that I get asked a lot, even though this game is six years old at this point. Um, if you did enjoy this video, I, I would ask that you would subscribe to the channel. You'll get to see more informational videos like this about Civilization VI, and you also get to see the big number go burr. If there are any videos that you'd like to see on civs like this or leaders, like the video that I did now, please let me know in the comments below and I'll review them and see what I can do. A big thank you to all my Patreon supporters and my YouTube members. Your support is greatly appreciated. Once again, if you wanted to watch me stream, I stream on twitch.tv slash Bostheus. I usually stream around 12 p.m. Pacific time. That's th Monday through Friday, but I don't always have a set schedule. If you wanted to know when I am streaming, you can join my Discord or you can follow me on Twitter and I announce when I'm streaming there. Once again, thanks for watching, everybody, and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Bye-bye! Bye-bye-bye!